The man of sin already happened. It's a fact. Jesus already returned. That's a fact. Just hear me out on this story. It's really simple. You know? All right, so Paul sits down. Picture it. You know, there's some concrete walls or something. You know, however you want to picture it. He's got his quill and his little parchment, and he writes a letter. He literally wrote this letter, and he sent it to the people in Thessalonica, or to the Thessalonians. And the Thessalonians grabbed the letter, right? They received it, and then they read the letter. Whenever Paul wrote that letter, the temple was still standing. And he was writing to the Thessalonians. It's addressed to them. What did he say? If the man of sin was for us, then that would be written down in the Bible, right? If the Bible was for us and the man of sin was going to happen with us in our day, then that would be written down in the Bible for us. But that information is not even in the Bible. Paul did not waste his words. Whenever he was with the Thessalonians, he said, Remember you not, brethren, whenever I was yet with you, I told you these things. So remember you not, when you know, months ago, uh, whenever I was actually with you face to face, I already told you this. I told you what withholds before the man of sin shall be revealed and come and sit in the temple, right? And be destroyed with the brightness of Jesus' coming and the word of his mouth. Well, we don't even have that information. Nobody ever wrote it down for us because it's not to us. Right, this is just a letter to the Thessalonians that later on the Catholics and them put compiled into a book and said, hey, this is for us. So Paul writes on the letter and they say, hey, guys, gather around. Paul wrote us a letter. You know, let's tell everybody what he said. He said, we're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief, right? Because they would still be alive for that day. And he told them to be sober and watch. They were like, hey, we got to be sober and watch. We can't sleep in the night as others sleep in the night. We literally got to leave people awake at night because we don't know what hour he's coming. All right, so we have watchmen literally staying awake so that we can flee Judea whenever this happens and go meet the believers out in the wilderness. Paul also told the Thessalonians, he said, May God preserve their whole bodies, souls, and spirits until the coming of their Lord Jesus Christ. Their bodies also, because some of them would still be alive. So he says, Look, I already told you guys what withholds before the man of sin shall be revealed, who will exalt himself above all that is called God, sit in the temple, right, and be destroyed with the brightness of Jesus' coming in the word of his mouth. Now, whenever they read these things, they didn't go, Paul, you're such a liar. <laughs> We're not in darkness like that day is going to overtake us as a thief. May God preserve our whole body, souls, and spirits. This isn't for us. This is for people 2,000 years from now. No, they read the letter. They knew it was to them. And he said the mystery of iniquity did already work. The man of sin was already alive. It was already working. So how can you get... All right, so the temple was still standing then. Paul writes this to them and says, hey, the mystery of iniquity already works, right? And then the temple's destroyed. How is the mystery of iniquity already working 2,000 years ago? And then that temple's destroyed, and now the mystery of iniquity is working 2,000 years later. How is that possible? Can't be. But what happened in their lifetime? In their lifetime, they saw this come to fruition. A man of sin came, John of Gascala, Simon Barjora came, Jewish zealot leaders who rejected Jesus. These guys were worshipped as the Messiah. Right, slaughtered 12,000 of the priests in the council to take over the temple. Literally slaughtered 12, the whole priesthood, all the council of the priests. They slaughtered them all, stained the floor the altar with their blood. This is the abomination that made desolation, was these guys taking over the temple and being worshipped as the Messiah by millions of Jews, all of Judea. Even where they were scattered, worshipped these men as the Messiah. That's why they all gathered from all over the world for Passover to come meet them in the temple. And whenever that happened in their lifetime, the Thessalonians knew, hey, this is what Paul talked about. This is a one-time event, guys. It's not like throughout history men would just take over the temple and kill anybody who didn't agree with them. I mean, these guys fought the Romans. They made Herod Agrippa II flee. He had to flee to Rome because they were going to kill him. Because if no matter who they were, rich, poor, free, bond, they would not allow them in the temple to exchange their currency. That was like their bank for everybody, you know. They took over the treasury. It was so rich that whenever the Romans destroyed it, they used the things of the temple to build the Colosseum. <laughs> these guys hated Christians, would kill Christians, right? And these guys were destroyed with the brightness of Jesus' coming and the word of his mouth. It's recorded that in 66 AD, the zealots started fighting, right? They were fighting other unbelieving Jews. It brought Rome to them. They killed a Roman garrison that came, and then they started this infighting, and it caused this war that was the most horrific siege in the history of the world, and people don't even tell you about it. Well, this is exactly... See, Stephen, <clears throat> he didn't give up his life for nothing. 
He said that Jesus would destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses. Right? So who destroyed that temple? Jesus. Right? Jesus kept telling them, Not one stone in this temple shall stand upon another. All the blood of the prophets shall be required at the hands of this generation. This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Since you didn't know the time of your visitation, the armies are going to come, can pass thee round, cast a trench about you, keep you on every side, lay you even with the ground and your children within you. Not one stone will be left upon another. It was all to them, and it happened in their lifetimes. And nobody ever did that. This is a one-time event. They took over the temple. They used it as a fortress. They fought. They were worshipped as the Messiah, literally Jews bowing to them saying that they were the Messiah because they rejected Jesus Christ. They kept the old Passover. They kept the old law. They rejected Jesus. They rejected the New Testament. And in 66 AD, there was seen a magnificent sight in the clouds. If you weren't there to see it, you wouldn't believe it. This is recorded in history. Armies and chariots and soldiers running on the clouds in shining armor and circling the cities in Israel. Why? Because exactly what Jesus said. He said their generation wouldn't pass until it was all fulfilled. He said that when the armies came and trampled Jerusalem underfoot from 66 until 70 AD, Revelation tells us that was 42 months, he said when that happened that those were the days of vengeance whenever all things written would be fulfilled. And he told the believers whenever they saw the armies come to flee Judea, which they did in 66 AD, they fled, is recorded in history too, and they looked up for their redemption drew nigh, and then they saw the sign of the Son of, the Man, Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now Christians... You guys got to be in trouble with God today. You've rejected everything that Jesus did. You say you want it to happen again, as if that never happened. You think that everything in the Bible is written to us. And you don't even think that these guys prophesied about what happened in their lifetime. Right? You think that they missed it. The greatest prophets of all time missed the greatest event in Israel's history that happened in their lifetime. The man of sin already came. He already sat in that temple. He was already destroyed with the brightness of Jesus' coming and the word of his mouth. What happened to the believers? Well, the ones that were out in the wilderness, they got raptured. Okay? The ones that were dead, the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. The temple had to be destroyed so that they could go up to heaven. Whenever old Jerusalem was destroyed, they went up into new Jerusalem. They asked Jesus what they would have. He said in the ages to come, they would have eternal life, and they do. That's why they said if the earthly house of that tabernacle were dissolved, they had a home eternal in the heavens when, when the temple was destroyed. And nobody can deny this history. A man of sin did come and sit in the temple. He was destroyed. Simon Barjora, one of the Jewish zealot leaders, on the day the temple was destroyed, he came up out of the rubble, dressed as a Judean king, right? Because they worshipped that guy as the Messiah. But whenever the temple was laid waste, rubble, fire burned through it, he was hiding in the tunnels underground. He came up out of that rubble, and the Romans took him and beheaded him right on the spot, right on the, right on the Temple Mount. If you cannot see what I just said, if you can't hear it, simple, easy, factual, and common sense, if you can't hear that, you've got to ask yourself, what spirit might you be possessed by? If your Jesus disagrees with the real Jesus, if your body of Christ disagrees with the apostles, if your Holy Spirit disagrees with what the Holy Spirit said, what is actually going on here? I have videos explaining all that. If you're here up to this part of the video, give me a follow.